All right. Hey, everybody. This is me, your host, Calvin Lowe, the Logan Power Show nationwide, worldwide. And I am honored again, have a special segment here, the Logan Power Show that we talk about people who dream big, people who talk about I'm not going to allow circumstances to stop me uh, from where I'm going. Uh, I have with me a very, very, very special guest. Um, she is excited that she is being running as an independent for President of the United States. Uh, if you don't know, follow back. Her name is Ms. Jade Simmons. Uh, she started back in February of 2020. She made her a decree that she was going to run for president of the United States. I know due to the fact that we had COVID-19, uh, the big um, sort of snowballed bubble effect in March. So really, we haven't really seen too much as what we could see, but we were, have, we were able to get the special interview here. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Ms. Jade Simmons. How you doing, ma'am? I'm good. Thank you, Calvin. This is special for me. We appreciate all the independent outlets. You guys have been giving me a voice. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. We're here at the Logan Power Show. We have no bias. We have to tell people right now, you know, you choose who you want to choose from. Uh, we, we always go by foundation and principles. We want to give people an opportunity to hear your voice. So the big question, you know, we, we see people have come out. Mr. Kanye West just said a couple of days ago, I'm running for president of the United States. Well, he hasn't put his, he ain't put no signatures down. He's just saying it, but nothing yeah. he's been done. He said it before last year. Uh, the Democratic side, we have Vice President Biden. Currently, the Republican side, we have President Donald Trump. The biggest question that people always say is, why would you decide to run now? And what makes you so different than the other candidates? That's the biggest question we have today. Well, the difference, I mean, where do we start? We need the whole show to talk about the difference, right? But I think what people need to be asking is not, why are you better than the others? Why are you right for this moment? That's the question we're not asking about the candidates. We're going with what we're used to. Right, we've either gotten used to President Trump, if that's possible, <laughs> and the people who love him, uh, love him. You know, the funny thing is the opposition we get when we have Trump supporters comment on my page, all they say is Trump 2020, fist in the air and they keep it moving because they believe in their guy. When I get opposition from the left, I don't get anybody saying Biden 2020, nobody out of the 100 naysayers that we get, no one says that. They only say, stop what you're doing. You're going to split the vote. They only say, we need to get that other guy out. Why in the world are we settling at this crucial moment in time for something that is, a, that is, that is just going to be status quo all over again? You know, I keep saying, it's not about why wasn't I doing this two years ago? That's a false narrative that it should take two years to run for president. You go to European countries, it's a four to six month election with five and six people on the ballot to choose from. Yet we're supposed to be the democracy. So the funny thing is the same people, Calvin, who say to me, you're gonna split the vote, which is a myth by the way. But the same people who say that to me are the same ones who'll say, this is a democracy. Well, democracy only flourishes with a variety of choices. So if we're not afraid to really allow the American people to choose, then we should be celebrating other ballot choices. You can't be upset about the Electoral College because you think it takes the votes out of the American people's hands and then be upset when another candidate enters the race because it puts another choice in the voters' hands. So we got to get consistent in this season. There's hypocrisy on the left and the right. And I'm running now because uh, we just we're sick and tired of the division. We're watching two parties pretend to fight for us, but they're actually just fighting each other. Absolutely. So to me, the time is now. The time is now. Gotcha. So the time is now. So the biggest thing right now, let's talk about one thing that we don't talk about. What will make you different when it comes to, when I say about financial stability? Sure. And the reason why it's about financial stability is that we are currently at a $23, $23 trillion deficit with rises that are still going. We yeah. talk about there are jobs that are being added, but there's still unemployment. and There's not an even balance kill. Um, we also talk about like, hey, um, we always hit the biggest slogan, make America great again. But based off of how our democracy, our capitalism, how we design things, we rely upon outside resources to help us keep the wheel moving. Whoa, Calvin, wait a minute. What you, you, you're not saying what you're supposed to be saying. You're not supposed to say You're talking real talk right there. So here's what you're going to have. You're going to have a system that either settles for government-controlled poverty which is what we currently have right now with the way the welfare system is set up. You're going to tell us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but then when you get the promotion, you're going to yank away the assistance 
that actually helped us <laughs> pay the bills in the first place. You're not going to allow us to have a savings account so we can save the money to actually rise, right? We have to go cash our, our checks at the liquor store. Come on, can we, can we keep this? How, how real we want to keep it, right? That's government-controlled poverty. So if we keep voting for a system that allows that, then you're going to have children growing up watching their parents in poverty. That will be the only model they have. This is not just economic sustainability we need. We need a paradigm shift in how we do econ at the, at the economy. Right now, we judge the economy. We, we call it healthy because the GDP and the stock market are doing good. Well, the stock market is doing well right now in the middle of COVID. You know why? Because the people who buy stock are the people who hold our debt. <laughs> so when we're in debt, the stock market is doing really well. So if you want to believe that the economy is good, listen, only 22% of African Americans in particular saw any kind of increase in the last four years. So don't believe the lies when you hear Republicans say this is the best it's ever been for African Americans. That's not true, right? So why are the jobs number before COVID, why were the jobs numbers good? They said it's the best unemployment rate we've had. Well, it's because people were working two and three jobs to make ends meet. That's not a good economy. And right now, the unemployment numbers are worse than they're being reported. And the reported numbers are the worst <laughs> they've ever been. So you're seeing uh, what, what is not just an inequality. You're seeing a disparity that has been exposed because of COVID-19. We couldn't turn our faces from it this time around. So what's different is you're not going to hear anyone else talking about a paradigm shift where the economy is concerned where people now are gonna have access to more opportunity, right? So I'm a small business owner. If you're like me out there, that stimulus check took a long time to get to you. It's funny because all these big chains got their money first. It's funny because we cry socialism, except when the big corporations are getting bailouts. You know, we need a flip of the economy. If you elect President Trump, what you're going to have is more of the same, but we really can't be mad at him, Calvin. We elected him because he was a businessman, but we didn't pay attention to how he ran his business. So the same way he ran his business was the only way he would know to run, to run the economy. If we elect uh, Vice President Joe Biden, you have a man who's going to come in there beholden to the corporations that elected him, beholden to the Democratic Party, which we already know has a habit now of stifling voices rather than raising them, the so-called party of the people. And so for him to flip the economy in the way that it needs to be flipped, that, it's just not possible. Uh, under his under his control. So the president is not the solution to everything. But you must have a person at the top that's not fighting against the people at the bottom. And that's what we currently have. Got it. Absolutely. Now, we talk about fighting to the fighting against our people, like people don't understand that they're the executive branch is not the real people that run the show. It's a legislative is there are is our house of representatives senators um things that we don't talk about city council county council those are the ones that are that are passing the judicial system is going to pretty much going to make good to defend what's been passing this law how will you be able to be the mediator yeah and also the voice the the actual image of what the United States of america is and what i mean by that is a lot of people don't understand uh, to my mi personal military experience, what you say as president or commander in chief affects you not just, you know, you, you can say what you want in the United States, but, but, but the, the paradigm effect is that the, 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 the actual, the rhetoric and the tone affects you when you step across the United States lines. So how would your tone, how would your rhetoric, how would that be different than the there current is. administration? Yeah, that, man, that's, a, that's one of the best questions I've gotten on any of the interviews I've had such far, so far. And I'm guessing that's because you're military. You understand. So the president's going to serve you in three ways. They're going to be head of state. They're going to be commander in chief. They're going to be the person executing those laws that we need Congress to actually work together on to do. That's a whole other story. So I want to answer your direct question. This country is in desperate need of a PR image overhaul. So here's what's happening. You talk about that debt in the beginning, $23 trillion. 20, 24 trillion is where China is. You know, they're, they're bad off too. We talk about that like an economic issue. It's a national security issue. Being in that much debt is a national security issue. The other issue we have now is as commander in chief, you have a president currently that makes his military decisions based on what's going to play well in the headlines in the U.S., what's going to help his reelection. So when he took out General Soleimani, it wasn't that Soleimani wasn't a bad guy. 
But what was happening on the ground, which, which troops will tell you, is that actually over there what was happening was the people themselves were beginning to rebel against their own government. That was playing in the U.S.'s favor. When we went over there and took out their general, we gave them something to rally around and to rally against us. Everybody knows you've got to build in a whole, there's a ground game you have. You've got to start to get the people on, on your side, right? Before you go in there and liberate them. <laughs> so what we did was we had a president who had intelligence, Calvin, that told him Soleimani was not the number one target, was not the number one threat at that moment in time to the U.S. He laid the actual threats aside to go after the guy whose name would be recognized by his base. He even told his people, that's not a big name. We got to go after a big name. Because, that, because he's from show business, right? So that's what he's going to do. That's dangerous. So the difference that you're going to have here is a president who, of course, believes we got to make sure that the American people are served, right? But we've also got to be in the, we got to be at the table. You withdraw from the who, you withdraw from all the different international organizations because it looks like you're playing hardball. You're now outside of the decision-making process that's still going to affect this nation. We saw the screw-ups that we had with the World Health Organization. Why do we now exit stage left and allow China to come in and take our spot? So we now need uh, a leader who has the toughness, but is also not reigned over by their emotions. You can't afford now to have a leader who, depending on his mood, will decide who to strike, depending on his, his whimsy, will decide what's in the best interest of the American people. We now have to have a consistency. I also think if you look, um, and I always tell people, do not vote for me because I'm black. Don't vote for me because I'm a woman. <laughs> vote for me because what you hear coming out of my mouth makes sense for what the country needs right now. But that being said, the countries that dealt the best with COVID-19 were female leaders this time around. So what you're going to have with female leaders in, in, in general, this, this is generalizing, but what you're going to see is a tendency now to move from a place of a well-rounded, long-range range approach more than a short-term, uh, emotionally uh, reactive approach, which is the opposite of the stereotype, right? Women are supposed to be emotional. But what you saw where women were leading based on what was best for the people, not best for the profit and the bottom line, not best for personal agenda. That's the kind of stuff that you can expect from me uh, as a leader of this nation. Got it. So piggybacking off of being a female, we gotta, we gotta always, always gotta get the cat out the box. You're an African American female. We talk about the biggest thing we don't talk about in America. We can say Black Lives Matter. We already know it's an issue, but systematic racism is one of the number one situations that is the underline. What I mean by that, affirmative affirmative action was something that was supposed to put in place that was supposed to balance everything across the board. Yeah, it was supposed to have been in place to say, hey, you're not supposed to have it to where. It's just 80,000 Caucasians. You got to mix that thing in place. You got to make sure that you got African Americans, Hispanics, even the keel. So, what we had, we had people on board saying, let's get rid of affirmative action because, you know, the Caucasians are the ones that are being affected because we don't get the jobs. Now, the underlining from that is that that was a lie because if you look at as America as a whole, yeah. When you think about African Americans, if we only are 33% of this 300 plus million, then we not the ones in power because the if you look at the, if you, it doesn't have the math. So yeah. affirmative action is thrown out there. We don't have that in place. I'm in South Carolina, the, the right to work state, which means I can fire you if it might shrug my shoulders if it feels wrong. And it's in place, the law. But systematic racism is where I talk about what the problem I have is the good old boy system. The good old boy system is that. Um, for yourself, we've seen it before. Previous administration, people got on President Obama said your 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 cabinet has to be diverse. You can't have an all black cabinet. Can't do that because you have all black people. You know you're you're pretty much are being you're a racist. But the current administration is giving a I'm giving a full example. If you were to say, let's take a good glimpse of how you look. Does it identify of a diverse situation? It's not. It's not diverse. It's just not diverse. So, and we see a lot of companies where they say, oh man, black lives matter. It matters. Well, it seemed like it's a slogan to them because you're not really saying black lives do matter. What I mean by black lives matter is, I give an example. Let's say basketball. 75% of the NBA is African-American, but there is only one African-American owner. 
There has been never one NBA commission that's a black African American for a a multi billion dollar business. When if you go off your top fifty players, seventy plus percent of them are African American. Mm-hmm. If we want to say let's go into football, another sixty seventy percent African American. There's not one African American owner. People talk about power. We do have a – you can say the African – the child, the person in charge of the NFL Players Association is black, but who's the commissioner? So when, a, so when a young man or a young – when a young man walks across there and say, I'm going to shake that person's hand, my dream of my family is that I'm going I'm to be selected to the NFL, the NBA, and I'm going to have this jersey, the person who I'm shaking hands with does not look like me and cannot identify who I am, and I've seen it all the time. My father worked for Pepsi, has been working for Pepsi for 21 plus years. Same position. Wow. Big in business now. My father's about to turn 75 years old. He should be the boss. But a guy who is young, half his senior is over him. My father's way overqualified. But Pepsi has not decided to let that African American man who is a feel good story. So the systematic racism of being the president of the United States. How would you put a law to stop this? Because what happens is I believe a lot of businesses are doing slogans because the narrative has changed, but we're not really answering the laws is going to make it so that people that look like us can be, have a table, be on the table or have a voice at the table. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, what I'd rather than be able to do is build a table. (laughs) And the way that you do that is there's no one rule, one law that gets rid of systemic racism and systemic injustice. So the reason that I'm running right now, first of all, I have been running since the beginning of the year. It's just people are starting to hear my voice now and it's coinciding with the racial unrest that we're seeing now. So let me, let me make a disclaimer before I launch into what I'm gonna say, <laughs> because what I'm gonna say, uh, you're gonna need the disclaimer. <laughs> Excuse me, I had someone hit me up in my inbox, um, a Caucasian woman who was saying, oh my gosh, your candidacy is incredible. I love what you're saying, but you know, please be careful that you don't get pigeonholed um, as just being a candidate for, for black people because that's all I've been hearing you talk about lately. Well, that's only been the last couple of weeks now that people have been hearing policies that we put out. We have a, you go to Operation Restoration 2020.com and we have a section, you go under the Pro Human tab, you're gonna see something called Shades of Breakthrough. We very boldly led with breakthrough for black America. Now, there will be breakthrough for immigrants. There will be breakthrough for Native Americans because they are always the footnote in our conversations here. There will be breakthrough for children because we never talk about policies that will advance uh, what children need in this nation. America actually ranks very low in terms of children's rights and opportunities for children. I say all that to say I will proudly be a president to all You're looking at an African-American woman who has spent most of her career and professional life in a Caucasian world, a classical musician. (laughs) That's my training. I speak now to the world's top billion dollar corporations. I'm in rooms that are 90% full of white men. Um, I have no problem with these groups. I have no problem with multiculturalism. But the problems that we're seeing now, honestly, are because we have not systemically built in programs that create success, not just for minorities, that's one of the issues, but for black people. So I'm the recipient of a scholarship that will remain nameless, um, just because I haven't told them I'd be mentioning them. But I had this scholarship when I was young, Calvin, and it was, uh, it's the, the namesake of that scholarship is a very famous black man. And the original recipients of the scholarship for the years that I was in the program were black, black kids, black, black students. The program has now evolved. They've changed their language to offer scholarships for minorities, which sounds great. It sounds inclusive, doesn't it? But what started to happen was over the years, minorities started to be anybody but black kids. And they went to where the scholarship used to go to black kids who were in underserved communities or disadvantaged, but excelled in spite of their disadvantage. They started to go to uh, minority kids who were not disadvantaged at all and were excelling because of their access and because of their Uh, different levels of privilege. So that one program, like a front of action, that started out with one intent, didn't actually serve the intent that it had. Okay, so I needed to put that out there. 
I'm not even going to the, the baseball, basketball, NFL thing. I've been talking to my husband about that for years. I'm like, this doesn't, this system doesn't add up. Here's the thing that you're gonna have to have. You're gonna have to have a three-pronged approach here. You can't just focus on police brutality and law enforcement or criminal justice reform. You have to pair that with economic reform. You have to pair that with educational reform. So you're gonna see me talk about breakthrough plans that have concentric circles that combine all three things. Now, <laughs> that last thing you're talking about, that symbolism, listen, I applaud people for getting the statues down. I'm glad Aunt Jemima's off the shelf. I'm glad companies are coming out with their statements of solidarity. But if we're not careful, this moment will be fleeting and it will be nothing but symbolism. I don't wanna hear a company talk about standing in solidarity when the board is still not diverse, when the senior leadership is still not diverse. I also don't want tokenism. And that's what we're risking right now. Do not just put black faces, Asian faces, Indian faces on your board. If they're holding a leadership position, I've been in this position, where you hold the leadership position, but you don't actually have influence. That's symbolism. And this is a moment that we are about to lose to symbolism if we either reelect the current president who has no intent to further this movement. In fact, he does everything he can to either stoke division in it, to, to stoke fear in his base and to quell the movement. And if you have the other side with Vice President Joe Biden, I believe we get status quo. I think we feel better. We got rid of the boogeyman in the White House. But are the systems really going to change in a way that's going to affect more people? So you have to have those three areas of reform. I'll end by saying, if you go to my website and you look at Shades of Breakthrough, Breakthrough Plan for Black America, you're going to hear me talk very boldly about something that sounds a lot like the Marshall Plan we put in place back in the 40s to help Western Europe. So if we can go over there and help another uh, nation with their economic prosperity, I think we got to do the same thing here. So you're going to be talking about criminal justice reform, economic reform, making sure that not just minority businesses, but black businesses are allotted certain government contracts that black businesses have access to funding, that black homeowners have access to funding uh, to buy homes, that you have entrepreneurial charter schools and underserved communities so that we can learn financial literacy so that you have education reform where you're reforming the way we teach history so that our kids and white kids and Asian kids and Indian kids grow up knowing the history of Africa mm -hmm. and the history of African Americans beyond slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, um, and, and chronic poverty. So yeah. again, this is a season now we got to push and we can't, we can't settle for gradualism. Absolutely. So we can't settle it for, now we talk about education. I love education. The biggest divide that we have is public education and charter education. That's yeah. one of the biggest things we have in our system. And what I mean by that is public education funds is not that the charter school is just that, hey, you got a, you got a board, you got a crew, and that crew just said, hey, we want to build here. And we started it. Now, what happens with that charter education is, is that once they're full, now you have a waiting system, and now it's like a, a playing cards game. There we go. And the public education is getting thrown into the wolves. And what I mean by that is we're not, we're not stepping in yeah. and saying, you know what, you need to have a balance or have like after school programs that's going to sort of mesh with the community. And what I, you mentioned by financial literacy, things like that. Now, keep in mind, you don't learn that in high school. High school is nope. not going to teach you about financial literacy. You're not going to learn that in middle school. You're not going to learn it in elementary. You're not going to learn about these things. Mm -hmm. And it depends if you're in a. It depends if you're a parent that you want to volunteer for the classroom and you want to be really active and you know entrepreneurship. You can teach that to the class voluntarily. But most classrooms, let's be honest, it's it's oversized. It's it's one on thirty. Yeah. So the way that we do our education systems the way that we do police That's right. community thing. You have one law, one officer per 50 to 100, and you expect mm -hmm. things to get done. The same thing you'll have with education, you'll get one on 30 unless you have, unless you in another school where you're paying 10, 20, 30,000. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, then the class size just drop from one to 30 to one to 15, maybe one to 12. So yeah, absolutely. But an average parent 
cannot afford to say, I'm going to put my child in a private school where, hey, we're, we're going to do these numbers. No, you can't. I, let, me, let me tell you, we, we talk about that the average parent. First of all, in my family are some incredible uh, women in education. Uh, my aunt, uh, who is here in Charleston, has been the head of schools that run the gamut. She's done, uh, she, you know, she's title one by choice, right? So, so she says, I want to be in the communities that are underserved. And she has a record of flipping those schools. But she's also been in the private, in the charter school system. Uh, she, so she knows the discrepancies firsthand. And so the way that she says is, oh, yeah, we should all have school choice. Every school should be a choice school. Every school should be excellent enough that if I can't afford to send my child to private, they're still in an excellent choice public school. So what, what we should have is that the public schools have to be nurtured to the point that if that is your only choice, it's a good choice. And that's what we don't have right now. You got to support teachers. Teachers have been undervalued, underpaid. Those of us who had to homeschool suddenly in COVID, we're ready to pay our teachers now, right? Standardized testing was supposed to be so important. Nobody talked about standardized testing during COVID-19. We threw it out the window like it was nothing. What does that mean? The millions we spend on, on uh, standardized testing should be going into our teachers' pockets for their salary. You shouldn't have teachers who are busting their butt in a classroom every day and then working two bonus jobs to, to pay for their housing. That's ridiculous. So you've got to pay teachers what they're worth. Revolution in the education system will come from one place, from the parents and the teachers combined. It will have to be a floor up a demolition that you're going to have to have. One of the things you're going to have to have as well, I believe from the beginning, is a re reform in the Head Start program that affects our community um, disproportionately. You're looking at a program now that function almost more like daycare than it does that pre-education. It also doesn't hold our parents accountable. Parents are going to be key here. But you're talking to someone who has a student, a child, who we needed certain accommodations for. We could not send him to the public school we wanted to send him to that was more diverse. We live in a predominantly white area where we are in Houston, Texas. So we wanted a school that was as diverse as possible. If we'd left him there, he wouldn't have had the resources he needed at the public school. We ended up paying what, account, what accounts to most people's mortgage a month for him to go to the school that he needed to go to. Incredible school. But my husband and I, both were born and raised right here in Charleston, went to public school, Orangeburg Elementary, St. Andrews High School, C.E. Williams Middle. We wanted our kids to go to public. And so we were starting to pay for his education, which is like a college education. And we said, how many families, how many other little boys who look like him can just up and have their parents pay a mortgage to send them to school to get what they needed? So we have to start now by making sure our public schools can serve all of our students, and they can't. We also need congratulations to you going into the school system. I want to make sure that my son, who keeps asking me, do guys even teach, can see more teachers who look like him because you're going to relate in a different way. So we also need multicultural training for our teachers. When we have teachers working in minority communities that they're not from, there needs to be a training there. There's a racial equity institute that does training like that for teachers so that they can be ready to teach the diverse populations that they have. So, you know, this is an era now where we can't afford to put Band-Aids on things. We have to dig down to the root of the issue. We're going to need more parental education. Uh, you know, I think we're going to have to have things that look like parent universities to help us learn this new math. You know what I'm saying? So Absolutely. that when our kids are stuck at home with us in an epidemic, mm -hmm. we have the capability to teach them and nurture them. Absolutely. Teaching is going to start in the home and we have to support the homes uh, that need the support in order to give students what they need even before they're getting into the school building. Got it. Uh, so you, I, think, I think, like I say, it's, it, we, it's not as simple as reform anymore. It's, it's a paradigm shift of major Got it. Got it. So with that paradigm shift, there's two questions to this one because I want people to talk about this. Um, broadband access. We know we're in rural areas. Because of the COVID-19 has really proven that we do need broadband access, high-speed internet, um, not just in the big cities, not in the places where we can afford it, but we need it across the nation. It's going to be like a total, total diverse situation. What I mean by that, a lot of parents who are underserved um, make it that they don't have the finances are using their cell phones to do mobile hotspot, which is not designed 
to actually accommodate the speed for what you want these certain devices to do. Like if you want a parent to be able to do some of these programs, you need a vast high speed internet. Um, you need to be to accommodate. Um, I want to be able to say like, hey, I can give a person that lives in Monk's Corner, Denmark, South Carolina, places that are very rural, the same affordability of being able to get internet access is the same people that live in Charleston, North Charleston, Columbia, Greenville, places like Myrtle Beach, places like Daniel Island, places that have that kind of affordability. That's what I want. So that's the thing that I'm looking for. And the second thing, um, I had an idea. It's really simple. It's just something that you may think about. It's called the, the three-parent law. What it is is that you allow a parent to come to the classroom, you're given three days, you get three tax credits on those days to be able to be in your kid's classroom three times out of the year. That means you pick three days. If that employer says, hey, we can do this, just like with you're a military, you say you holler at military person, right? You get a tax credit. So if the, if the businesses decide to say, hey, we're going to educationalize. If black lives matter, I'm going to let the parents matter. So if you're a parent, I'm allow you have three days out of the entire fiscal year to basically to, to, to put the all into your kid's education. What that allows a parent to do is to say, it gives you an option. If a teacher has a class has a 30, if you got three, if you got three days, teacher can choose the three days you can come in. That means if the teacher has five days, five days out the week, if you got 30 parents, you got 900 days to, to work with. And it's tax credit. So that means those parents that are working these hard jobs and I can't get the time, my job won't pay me, now I'm going to pay you to give three days. Now, listen, if you can do COVID-19, you got COVID-19, you're 14 days automatically paid for. That's in the law. The federal government, I'm asking for three days, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I promise <laughs> to God, it's not that hard. And our educational system is what really matters. So all I'm saying that those are the two things, broadband access, it can be done. Wow. All you got to do is tell Comcast, AT&T, to all those jokers, hey, you know what? You know what? We're going to streamline this Affordable Care Act, Internet Care Act. Mm -hmm. You create an Internet Care Act to make it affordable. What will happen is instead of your Comcast bill be almost 90, 200, I spoke to a person that paid $260 a month. And almost $140 of it is internet access to have high speed to function. But it had the bill, instead of a reason, they do a triple play act. Huh. Or if you have a certain thing there. So that's just an idea. What's your thoughts upon that? Well, my question is, when are you going to run? No. Mm -mm. <laughs> I, I, I listen, listen. And I let listen. you talk. No, no. <laughs> listen. Um, that's powerful. You know, the broadband question the, the, the reason when we when we decided, I say we, my family, uh, my company, uh, the people who are with me on this journey, when we decided to, that we were going to do this now. We had two strong sensa sensations. We felt like we were coming into an era where there were going to be an increase in the tension between race relations. We thought that was just because of how things was politically. We felt like uh, with the two party system, especially. That issue was going to be made worse, not better. I didn't know George Floyd was going to be murdered as he was and that we were going to be in this moment. We also thought we were coming to a season where all these inequalities you're talking about, all those disparities would be exposed and we wouldn't be able to turn our face away. I didn't know COVID-19 was going to play out like that. Both of those things are happening right now. Suddenly, we were able to get devices in kids' hands. Suddenly, we were able to open up access to the internet. We need to pay attention to what we did in crisis and make our crisis behavior our mode of operation. So we come out of that survival mode and how do we now thrive? What did we learn? We learned teachers were valuable, pay them more. We learned more people needed healthcare, expand it. We learned broadband access wasn't a luxury, it was an absolute necessity. We also learned the same thing about water, Calvin. We're out here saying wash your hands, but we're cutting water off in people's homes. We gotta look at now making sure that if, if America is so great that every American has water flowing through their pipes, right? 
we care about the environment. Don't talk to me about polar ice caps. And I got lead coming out of my kitchen pipes. You see what I'm saying? So I think we have opportunity now to do things we never thought was possible. You kept saying tax credit, but the power behind the move you just talked about is that kids will see their parents are in school with them. There's a bond there that lasts beyond the classroom. Teachers will see parents are watching me. They know what's going on here. I, this is not the child to screw over because her mom's coming to school. You see what I'm saying? There's an accountability that, that gets built in, but there's also a power uh, that will happen for children and their parents. My kids and I, I, we already were on time in the school types of parents. COVID-19 still blew our minds. I learned more about my kids in that first week in terms of how they learn and how I can help them than I would have if everything had been back to normal. So I'm thankful for the reset we got, Calvin, because it allows us opportunities to do bold moves that we used to call socialism, and now we see that they are necessities, right? This is about access to opportunity, and now internet is opportunity. Internet is opportunity now, and so we do have to expand that access. I hadn't thought about those as being a part of platform issues now. I can honestly say you've given me two things to really think about, and put in as, as really specific bullet points. So I thank you for that. That's powerful. Absolutely. Now, when we talk about, too, given the opportunity of President of the United States, Supreme Court justice choosing due to yeah. the fact that we have a couple of them that are soon to be off we be with the Lord. Let's be honest. They are up there. They are up there in age. I had to, I had to be honest. The kid, like I said, there's people that have been in there for a long time, and you got to say to yourself, like, listen, I understand that you, you want to wear the hat. You want to put on the coat. I totally understand the power, but you got to say it's, it's time for new voices, the right people in place. I think that people thought that the conservative choices would have been the ones that keep us going, but as we can see, conservative is not what we need to look for. I'm a saying that if you if you were given the opportunity to choose a Supreme Court justice to be to be on our, our Supreme Court, what would you be looking for given the opportunity? I'm going to tell you two things I'm looking for, already looking for, have some people in mind, are independent minded thinkers. We cannot, there shouldn't even be a possibility to stack a court. A good negotiation must have people from diverse viewpoints in the room so that by the time they finish tussling, we know that what they come up with is going to serve more people than if it was lopsided and everybody got what they want. Here's what's promising about the current Supreme Court. I think the president thought he stacked it a certain way. They didn't end up voting as he thought they would. That to me was powerful. That to me means that I know a lot of people were upset about those choices. But maybe they were better choices than we thought because we're seeing them be independent-minded. They're not just towing the party line. That is priority number one. Uh, the reason that I'm running completely as an independent. You know, people look at me. I'm going to assure this as one nation under God. They see the under God part, assume I'm Republican because I'm openly Christian. They see the black skin, <laughs> right, and the, and the fact that I'm female, and assume I'm Democrat right now. So it's, it's stereotypes all around. When they hear me speak, they go, we don't know where to put you. That's who I believe most Americans are. So I would look to, to have justices that are independent-minded, have a track record of not towing the party line, of maybe being the dark horse, maybe being the underdog, uh, maybe being the devil's advocate. You need those people. I also believe we need much younger um, justices added to the court. We must keep wisdom in the court. We must keep wisdom and experience. But you have to have youth. You know. Your kids probably teach you something new every day, Calvin. I could write a book on what I've learned from my 12-year-old son. He has radically changed my life, my viewpoint, how I do life, because he's such my opposite. We must have youth on the court as well. I also believe, you didn't ask me this, but I'm going to just go ahead and say, <laughs> we need term limits. We need term limits. How can you be in society that is ever-changing and have leader position, leadership positions that are not? The, two, the math doesn't add up. So you're going to see someone who's looking for, always looking for the unexpected option, because I believe we want people who have a track record of not always caring about what everybody thinks, but they make decisions truly based on what they feel is best for um, 
humans, not just the American people, but best for humans. So those are the, the kind of the two things I'm looking for. I do have people in mind, some that I'm so excited about because I watch how they make decisions. Mm -hmm. And we now need to be electing people based on how they make their decisions. Absolutely. Now, the biggest thing you mentioned, faith. Now, we have a the separation of church and state. Your, your faith in Christianity, you, you, you talk about that on your website. Now, how strong are you in that belief? And the reason why I say that is because you see a lot of people that say, I believe in the Lord, but you, co but you contradict yourself based off the rhetoric and the tone that's given. You can't say, love thy neighbor as thyself, but you say, I hate other people and do it certain. That's the part that I love from there. That's scriptural. In First John, it literally says, right, that if, if, you, if you say that you hate your brother, you cannot say that you love God. You cannot love God and hate man. It also says, my friends who say, well, Jade, those people are wicked. Okay, let's play it out. Let's say they're wicked. In Ezekiel, God himself says, do you not think that I care about the wicked? That I want them to live, right? So to me, the reason I run openly as a Christian is because of what you just said. I feel like my faith has been hijacked on the right. I do not see Christianity represented powerfully correctly or properly i see a leader with no fruits of the spirit we're supposed to hold that so high right love joy peace patience kindness goodness gentleness faithfulness and self-control i don't see that in our current leader so we believe that a part of what operation restoration is here to do is to model what it actually looks like to be people of faith who step into the role of servant leadership servant leadership servant leadership not to serve ourselves to serve others what we have committed to is that we serve people all the way to the White House. You don't have to wait until November to see if I'm gonna do what I say I do. Watch us now, watch us now. <clears throat> the reason I speak openly about it is because I feel like it has been manipulated. Religion has been manipulated. Uh, we're seeing people sacrifice their morality in favor of getting a moral agenda. You can't say that you believe in the sanctity of life, which I do, and not care about the babies outside of the womb. How can you be okay with babies dying at the border? How can you be okay with the knee on George Floyd's neck if you're pro-life, right? But to my friends who are pro-choice, how can you not care about reproductive possibility? I'm concerned that all the abortion clinics are in our neighborhoods. I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned that black women are dying in the process of giving birth. I'm concerned that women who are going to the VA for their health care don't have proper uh, female care services that they have a high infertility rate coming out of the VA. Why are we not talking about these things? We got enough advocates making sure uh, that women have the right to choose abortion. My job is to make sure that women have the right to reproduce powerfully and that when she does it, her job's not going to drop her because she's pregnant. Mm, absolutely. That when she does it, if, if she's a single mom, the number one reason that uh, people choose abortion is not because of rape or incest. It's not because of fetal abnormality. The number one reason wasn't expecting to be pregnant. And if I go through with this pregnancy where I'm already being underpaid compared to my male counterpart as a single mom, I'm not likely to be able to afford this child. So I want to make sure she's getting paid equally. I want to make sure that they got paid family leave, right? Those are ways to me to make sure that we can also help women choose life more powerfully or more abundantly. I don't have to focus on overturning Roe v. Wade. I got to focus on making sure that women who want to produce can do it powerfully and that they are not choosing abortion out of victimization, out of loss of livelihood, and out of discrimination. These Absolutely. are things, we got to talk about this in different ways. If we just keep hollering out these fake labels, pro-life, pro-choice, well, pro-choice also means help women choose life. Pro-life also means care about life from the womb to the tomb. Let's stop with the rhetoric. Let's talk about real common sense, common ground solutions that don't leave us in a stalemate. Both parties want us to cling to those labels, Calvin, mm -hmm. so that we'll be scared of the other side. Right? Got it. And, and so I talk in a way that doesn't allow us to hide behind those lines. Got it. So since you're about those lines, people are going to talk about this too. Um, opening of church doors. You see it's going on yeah. in California. They're saying they're basically yeah. banning, banning worship. And I believe that, uh, I believe a church door should be open. I believe if you believe this Bible, then believe it. If you don't, then call it a day. Yeah. I, be, I believe in marriage between a man and a woman. That's mm -hmm. what I believe. That is going to be on the docket for you. 
what are your choices? What do you stand upon? Because people are going to ask, yeah. do you believe in a man and a woman? Mm -hmm. Are you believe in same sex marriage? Because what happens is I think that a lot of churches, um, this is how I believe. Sin is sin. Regardless of whatever you choose to do, you can say a sin is a sin. If you lie, that's a sin. If you fornicate, it's a sin. If you're with the same person you haven't said, that's a sin too. If you kill, it's a sin. These are all sins. And I believe that you got to live right and do right. A yeah. lot of times we, we, we talk about God is on our money, but we leave him out when it comes to laws and abiding those laws. So how do you say to those people to, that say like, hey, how do you feel about the church doors opening? Because that's a that's a huge comp. That's a huge thing mm -hmm. that we say we don't we say we don't want prayer in school, but you're a praying person. So mm -hmm. are you saying like, hey, I'm allowed prayer in school? I'm going to allow the church to have their own way and not be subject to what the government wants. Let's keep it question. real. Separation of church and state was designed to actually protect the church from the state. It, it, you know, so we need to understand that it, it wasn't, uh, you know, that church was going to infiltrate government. It was actually designed to make sure government didn't uh, burden the church. Here's what we got to do. We got to be consistent here. If we're okay with the protests in the street, if you got 60,000 on the street in Houston. We had that for Black Lives Matter March after George Floyd's death. You can't out of the same breath say you can't be worshiping in church right now because of COVID-19. We know in Houston, where we're peaking right now, the numbers are continuing to rise. We're going to see a new rise at the end of July because of the protests. So people are making a choice every day. I purposely, uh, personally believe that we reopened too soon, not because of timing, because we weren't prepared for the reopening. We didn't have enough testing ready. We didn't have enough uh, people ready to do testing and tracing. We just opened without being equipped to open powerfully. I do believe that churches have the right to meet they have to be cautious in how they're meeting. And what I'm calling for is consistency in the way that we put the rules down. If we're not banning protests, then you, you can't ban church doors be closed. It's just, it's a matter of consistency. Now, the, all the other issues, the cultural issues you're talking about, the faith-based issues you're talking about, the reason we run openly is so people can ask us those questions for ourselves. I get asked on the streets every day uh, where I stand with the G uh, LGBTQ community, uh, where I stand in, in terms of abortion. And here's how I base the way that I would lead. It's the way that I've lived. The word of God tells us to honor man, to honor them. The reason I run openly as a Christian is because when I look at the model of Christ, I see a man who spoke some hard truth. He said some hard things. It did not stop the way that he responded to and loved others. So my job as leader would be, I stand personally on some very strong convictions. And I always tell my, uh, my gay friends, I say, look, we're not going to agree on everything. We're never going to define marriage in the same way. I believe that traditional marriage is what God intended. Now, does that mean I go back and reverse all the laws that allow for gay marriage? No, that would be symbolic to me. It's a waste of time. My job now as the leader would be to make sure that no matter where you stand on gay marriage, whether or not you have a family, it's a same-sex couple, and you have kids, that you can make it home to your family every night. Nobody has the right to take your life or discriminate against you because you believe differently than I do. This is what's not being done right now. You have people running on religion and using that religion to oppress, using that religion to justify systemic injustice, and using that religion to continue to justify abuse, oppression, or discrimination. You cannot have it both ways. Now, here's what else that means, Calvin. When I tell you how I believe about something, that I believe in the sanctity of life, that I believe in traditional marriage, even though I say I'm, my job is not to impede on you living out your life because God gave us free will. We can see a countless number of laws in the Bible. The people continually disobeyed the laws God set forth. And what did he do? He was a gracious, a gracious God who gave us countless opportunities to do things his way. At the end of the day, the choice is ours, right? But here's the thing, Calvin. If you now are gaining more rights as a human, as a people group, that shouldn't take away my rights as a human and as a person who believe how I, how, I, how I believe. And that's what I think is not being allowed. We're not having that give, that give and take. Your rights end where my rights begin. Prayer in schools, let me end on that. You asked me that. I don't know about you. Prayer stayed in our schools. And what I mean by that is our children are taught to pray every day in every circumstance. 
<clears throat> as a Christian parent, do not allow uh, your kid to believe that they don't have the right to do that. They do have the right to pray in school. Whether or not the school is going to be able to mandate it or do it over the intercom like we used to do, that's another story. But I believe that Christians have to now rise up and decide for themselves, for, for, for me and my house, this is how we're going to live. <laughs> amen amen to that amen to that it's a it's a blessing to hear what you're saying and like what we believe in is that we're, we're trying to, to to stand for righteousness i like i said i have plenty of friends who may not you know they, their lifestyles is different all i can do is pray for you to be the best for you but we want to make sure that people are given a fair shake and we want to make sure also that you know we stand upon our principles and not compromise now you yeah. see a lot of compromise. Now you're you're talking about term limits, so you means you're putting senators on the chopping block. You're putting actual uh, yeah. house of house of representatives on the chopping block. People, yeah. these city council members, these county council, we're doing term limits. That means that these people all the way that, down that have given all this all the way, way down, down transition um, is going to pretty much hurt their pockets, hurt what they're doing, and you got to vote against your own self, which is kind of hard. That I would see those individuals. What do you mean, vote against your own self? What I mean by that is if you, if people, if you're the president, you're the, you're the leader, you're the one in charge and you believe in term limits, like you're saying, that means the senator's got to, got to say yes to that on the docket. It means they got to literally say, Hey, I believe what you're saying and I'm going to do this for two terms, but I'm going to be like Joe Biden doing for almost 20 plus years as a senator. Then went from that to the vice president of the United States. They're coming right back as a president. And if he chooses to go back as a senator, he could do that and he can go back and forth. There's people that's been House of Representatives for over 20 plus years. Yeah. And, and it's all, and like I said, it's not like you're getting, it's not like the money's not um, low. The money is high. The benefits, so, the perks are high. Perks and, are very high. The longer you're in, the greater the perks, the greater the power. Listen, we know absolute power corrupts. We know that. The biggest concern that people who really know me have for me is, Jay, we don't want you to get in there and change. Well, she don't have time. Four years, you're out, right? Or eight years, you're out. The people don't reelect re you. Listen, I grew up here in Charleston. We had one mayor my entire life here. Mayor Riley was the mayor for 40 years. I'm 42. That's not right. This is not the same city as it was 40 years ago. Why would you have leadership making decisions for a new now when a lot of, the thing, a lot of their belief system was set years, years earlier? I think it's, it's detrimental. Here's the thing. You're right. Are senators, are congressmen going to vote for that? It's going to be one of the biggest uphill battles. But let me tell you what's happening. The people are voting for it. We are finally seeing in many uh, places, many jurisdictions, people who've been in office a long time are being unseated. The great thing is the people who are taking their place, they're not lifelong politicians. They're people like you and me who said enough is enough. We're going to interject ourselves into this moment so we can represent those who believe like we do. And so what that means is people like myself and others who are coming in for the first time, we're not about this power thing. We were busy doing life before we interrupted our life to do this thing. We are ready to get back. <laughs> Every day, our team has to go, man, this thing here is real. And we'll get nostalgic over six months ago, you know, right? What used to be. So you're having newly elected officials now who I believe are coming in, not wanting to be in power forever. And that's what's exciting. That's when you're going to be able to change change those laws when you have newly elected officials who aren't coming in there just to be elected officials we have people like that in houston have you see them everywhere all the time and you have to wonder if we're really being served because all they're doing is running for re-election every every 18 months absolutely you're, you're spot on now what do you believe is the the cure and i mean by the cure um the actual cure for, you mentioned about giving teachers their increase, getting their actual fund being raised. What about military increase? I'm not talking about those, those boys on the officer level. I'm talking about those boys on the enlisted level. An average person enlisted coming in the military can be literally in poverty by day of day one. They don't, mm. make, a, they don't make enough. 
if you take a, if you take an enlisted bracket, your average enlisted people who serve this country maybe make maybe about twelve to eighteen grand a year. Like yeah, you get you got your lights, you got your water, so on and so forth. But say if you're trying to, to survive after that, you yeah. want to get a car to move around. So literally, you you you're you're tied to the government for four years, maybe two, six, however you choose it, yeah. um, and moving through the ranks. Um, so our teachers are underserved, our military is underserved. Um, how do you speak to those individuals? And the final one is minimum wage. That's the killer for the United States of America. What do you say to those things? The easiest, the quickest answer, minimum wage has to be raised wide away. It's been 725 since 2008. I can't think anything else that's been the same price since 2008, right? If, if bread and rice and milk <laughs> and house costs go up, how is minimum wage? So what I believe is on day one, you know, we have to, and, the, and Congress, by the way, has been working on this and for some reason can't get it done. Minimum wage should automatically be increased to $10. Just snap your fingers because then you'd have 16 states that instantly would have to increase their state rate. If anybody who's watching doesn't know that federal level sets what the states have to do. Here's the good news. A lot of states are already above 725, but that's because 725 is easy. It's a low bar. So we have to raise the national bar. I think that'd be at $15 an hour minimum by the end of what I would say would be my first two years in office. Everybody's saying by 2024. I think we got to go much faster than that because now look at COVID-19. You have people who are currently un unemployed, but you have people who are underemployed. I've been saying this and I'll keep saying it. You shouldn't have a billion dollar company that has people living below the poverty line on its roster does not add up. So we have to increase wages all the way around, which takes me to the military. I'll be honest, that wasn't even one of the issues we were focused on when we looked at the military. We were talking about military families, you know, helping them deal with deployments. We were looking at mental health um, issues in the military community. Uh, the issues I told you about with the VA, a lot of focus on veterans, but this is powerful, Calvin, because one of the things that I believe is why you must be a president for all. Um, we're used to now seeing what it looks like to have a president who is openly and unapologetically lopsided. You don't need that. And I think you honestly would get that no matter which way you go if you use one of the two major parties. So you must have a president who's a president for all, but I believe we now have an opening to have a president who's also a champion for underserved communities. And so I think we must raise those types of wages. I'm not going to sit here and say I had policy for it because I don't. You won't find that on the website. But again, you've given me issues to think about making at the forefront of the campaign because you said something. You said, well, yeah, we can survive. We got our lights. We got our, our water. But what's the irony of that? The people who we have on the front lines for our survival should be able to do more than just survive. Um, so, so that to me is powerful. I think we also have to make the way that uh, you get your schooling afterwards. That time shouldn't run out, <laughs> shouldn't run out. If you're coming out of the military, it's going to take you a, a year or two just to figure, get your feet, figure out where you are. You don't even know what you want to go to school for yet. So those benefits shouldn't run out as quickly as they do. That's one of the things we were looking at is making sure that you had the right to be able to, uh, to get that, to keep that uh, education that you're able to get that you went in for. A lot of people go in for to have the education paid for. Absolutely. You want to make sure that those benefits are extended but and you're giving me some good stuff to add to the to the docket here calvin i appreciate it oh yes absolutely we want to have some fun and we pray that everyone who's listening to us um see that presidential candidate miss jade simmons is just telling us about some things that she wants to see changed across the nation um she says she's pro-life um she wanted to have it to where people have the opportunity um to be able to keep uh, she says she's she wants to change things with minimum wage. She wants to see things change when it comes to uh, when it comes to our military. She wants things to be changed when it comes to how we govern uh, each other. And there's things that we we talk about. Uh, we talk about affirmative action, but we want to make sure that we weren't just talking about that. But we want to make sure that she was discussing how we got to change uh, how we deceive people, not at just saying Black Lives Matter, but on the corporate level and the big wigs. Now you've been doing TED talks. Um, you are one of the you are a big pro profound speaker. Um, so you, so the the thing is you have the education. Yeah, that's a check. You have the corporate knowledge. That's a check too. And you have the musical knowledge. That's a check as well. Mm -hmm. People are going to talk about um, 
your uh, military background values and, you know, how would you handle it? But let's be honest, um, the current president of the United States, he's not a military guy. So he's not going to he's not going to know all the ins and outs. So the biggest question is, if given your first chance in office, how would you strategically make decisions? Because you mentioned you are a faith based person. So is your prayer life will be your guiding tool? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people say I got the inclination, but you said I'm a, I'm a believer. So yeah. is your prayer life going to be your guiding tool for making these tough decisions that people said is not scientifically thought out? Yeah. Because yeah. let's let's go over some of our tough decisions. The um, the capture and and the actual death of Osama bin Laden was not an actual strategically thought out process. It was either you make it happen. If you make it, you, you miss, miss the moment. If you miss the moment, then there's two things will happen. You either can have a situation um, to where uh, I believe that if he would have survived, it would have been a re recalibration of a, a whole nother regime. Um, Saddam Hussein, yeah. you know, that was a that was a media chaos. You you killed one and then another one got into play. Um, you said Gaddafi was bad, but be honest with Gaddafi was talking about bringing more black, money to black people. So you got you got rid of him because you didn't want him what he was doing up in the northern Africa. That's all mm-hmm. that billions of dollars. That's what all the, that Mediterranean Sea. People don't understand it. Libya was running the show. So you got rid of Gaddafi. You say, oh man, he get rid of him. That's gone. Okay, he's out the way. Then you're talking about other peoples in Iran. You said, I'm going to Iraq. I'm going to Afghanistan. Afghanistan is number one when it comes to um, heroin. That's one of your number one exports of heroin is in Afghanistan. So I'm trying to figure out if you're given the first day in, what would be the way of how you would formulate your team? Yeah. Because you've seen teams have been developed. Like the current administration, what he started with, Almost 10 to 12 people have either been locked up or fired. Yeah, but see, and, and, we, and we have to stop pretending like anything the president did was surprising. He, you know, the lawyer that he used to have in his business was, was connected with the mafia, you know, out of New York. The, there was nothing surprising. And I think if we don't want to be surprised, <laughs> then we got to look at how our leaders have lived. Uh, what you didn't say is I have no political experience. I say that proudly. I believe the, the most dangerous thing we can do is to have a politician, a lifelong politician in office right now. People say, well, that was Trump's argument. No, that wasn't really his argument. And that's not why he was elected. He was elected because he mobilized and weaponized the frustrations of a demographic of Americans who, who did have, who did have uh, some cause to feel ignored, uh, who, who looked around and saw these numbers rising and felt like they were about to be replaced. He fed into all of that. He made it, he, he made an equivalent between the rise of people who've been historically underserved with an overthrow of people who have historically held power. And that was scary for them. And he mobilized that fear. He manipulated it and he's still doing it. He did the same thing for Christians who felt like they didn't have a voice, Calvin. Like whenever they said, I believe in traditional marriage, they were batted back, called bigot, you know, bigots, called every name in the book. That whenever they said, I believe in the sanctity of life, oh, you backwards person, you don't care about women's rights. Right. So you saw Christians be silenced. He mobilized that. He mobilized that silence. Right. So how do I make decisions? That was your question. Mm -hmm. I am a praying person. But in the natural, here's what you got to do. Bible says there's an abundance. There's wisdom and an abundance of counselors. First, you got to make sure your counselors are wise. (laughs) You surround yourself with good counselors. Here's the here's the kicker. You got to listen to your counselors. You have to actually listen to your counselors. The end of the day, you know, the way that we make decisions now, we pray over things every day. Every morning, we, we figure out what are we doing today? How are we leading today? But those quick decisions you're talking about, you're not going to have time to go, let me go pray and fast this one out. Because like you said, we, we need an answer right now, the Madam President. You make quick decisions. And I teach this in secular environments as well. You make quick decisions based on the core values you already had set up and were already operating by. So if you prioritize, here's my core value as leader, you prioritize people over profit, personal agenda, and politics every single time. That means that there probably would have been a different target than Soleimani for me because to prioritize Soleimani was about personal agenda. It was about re-election. You understand? So when you take out 
uh, bin Laden, you're looking at what he's already been linked to. What are the deaths that he's caused? What's the likelihood that he's going to do something like that again? That's a, that's a split time decision, but you're able to make it on core values. Look, we always prioritize people. Guess what? Not just our people. Not just our people. That must mean that if we are, if, if, if we are children of God who care about all of humanity, we're going to have to hold other nations accountable. We can't just be partnering with tyrants who are dehumanizing their own people, killing their own people, and turning our, looking the other way because we got a profitable trade deal on the table. This is a difference here. You don't hear anybody else talking like that. Have you ever heard another politician talk like this? It's because I'm not a politician. Got it. I'm not, 